Right, I've got the thumbs up. I think it's all systems go. Uh, cool, okay, let's get started. Um, my name's Don. I am uh, an F Sharp community co contributor. As a, uh, I, I originally started the F Sharp language design uh, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge in around 2003. Uh, contributed to C Sharp 2.0 as well, and it's great to be here at NDC. You might detect a slight Australian hint in my accent. Maybe it comes back a little more strongly as I as I come home. Uh, originally born and bred Queenslander. Uh, any Queenslanders in the audience? Yes. Yeah. Go, go Broncos. Uh, and um, yeah, wonderful to be back in Australia and to reconnect, uh, reconnect with uh, the dev community here, which didn't really exist back in 1994 when I packed bags and headed to England to do my PhD. It wasn't quite the same, uh, sort of tech, not, tech wasn't the same as it is now. You live in a great time uh, here in Australia where there are communities like this and worldwide that you can participate in. And uh, you hopefully live in a great time that you can use programming technologies that have improved dramatically since the days, uh, since the early 90s when I was living here. And one of those programming technologies you get to use is .NET, and one of the languages you get to use on .NET you and your teams is F Sharp. And uh, I'm very happy to have been part of bringing that to, uh, to, 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 to practical fruition. Now, I've been thinking about like, what, what am I actually doing when I give this talk? I say it's F Sharp code I love, but it's actually, one of the funny things about this talk, there's sort of several meta narratives underneath it, right? Uh, like, like most talks, or most talks I give anyway. And, uh, a very large part of this talk is actually aimed at, at C Sharp developers. It's actually, or aimed at, you can imagine there are teams who are using F Sharp where a, a lot of the people who come to use F Sharp, you know, they're not, um, they actually learn it on the, on the job. Okay, they, they just, this, we often see this, that the best way to hire F Sharp developers is to hire a good C Sharp developer. Just let them rip and use F Sharp and learn it as, as they go. It's not very hard. But uh, something happens in those teams, which is, which is important, in, in that sometimes there are people who are extremely gung-ho about F Sharp, extremely gung-ho about functional programming. Uh, and uh, they might have a lot of obscure language that they use, they might obscure, obscure terminology. Uh, they might write code that looks very different to other people's code. Uh, they might cause arguments between those teams. And, and in some ways, that's not a good, that's not a, good or healthy thing, and nor does it have to be like that. Uh, and so when I've given this talk in the past, often the people who come up to me after the talk are actually the ones in the team who want to rein in the use of some parts of, of either F -sharp, of F Sharp, or perhaps F Sharp people who want to rein in uh, the more extreme edges of object-oriented programming. So I want to kind of take the extremities of C Sharp programming practice and F Sharp programming practice and push them out a little bit and focus on this sort of core part of F Sharp, which is the F Sharp code, well, I love, and which is uh, embodied in, in what we think of as good positive F Sharp practice. Uh, and, um, and so that's really kind of the meta narrative underneath the talk for those of you who don't do F Sharp or are exposed to some, part, some small amounts of F Sharp programming or are, uh, you're not gung-ho functional people, but you're in, a, you're in a, an F Sharp programming team. And, uh, and that's also aimed at the gung-ho F-sharp people to think about, you know, how, where do we want to land the, the methodology and practice of F-sharp coding? Okay. So I'm going to do that. That's a meta-narrative. I'm not going to make that explicit uh, from now on. But it's really a code through, a, a walk through some of the code I love. Some of the code I don't like, I love a little less and then sort of talk about how that relates to the actual language design. Someone asked me last night, what makes a good programming language? And I found it, uh, and I ended up giving like a 10 minute spiel, which wasn't at all answering the question, but telling a completely different story, which is <coughs> there are two big streams of programming which come together in languages like F Sharp and C Sharp these days. And these streams of history, of, in the history of programming, they go all the way back to uh, in the world I've been out in, in Cambridge, right back to like 1950 when they made these first machines. And there were the people who actually made the machines 
And then there were the logicians. Okay, there were the Alan Turing's who actually fiddled and made with the actual machines. And there were the people like uh, <coughs> um, Church who, who sort of made the, uh, the abstract kind of world of computation, the, the, the lambda calculus and the like. And these two communities really literally, person by person over the years, grew up into sort of the, the world of imperative programming and the world of functional programming, roughly, roughly speaking. And, uh, and so a good programming language is, is, is one, well, for me, the aim has always been to take the core ideas of functional programming and make them really fly in practice. In, 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 in the practical world, in the, in the real world, connecting them through to the real world. And so uh, that, 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 that's what, it, to me, making a good programming language is all about, both in C-sharp and in F-sharp. And you can kind of see C-sharp and F-sharp as being two kind of partners in that game. One is taking an imperative programming language tradition and incorporating the functional elements into it. One is taking the functional programming language tradition and connecting it through to .NET and through to data sources and reality. Okay, uh, if you want to hear more about my ideas on, on history of programming languages, history of F Sharp, there's a lot about the history of .NET and C Sharp, uh, where those kind of traditions meet. There's a, this, this is available, it's a 40 page great rock and roll read of the history uh, all the way through the 80s and 90s and early 2000s uh, up to about 2012. F Sharp looks like his, slash history. Uh, Lots of characters make, a, make an appearance along the way. I tell, I, I tell a story, uh, two stories, one of the world of Microsoft and their sort of worldwide domination of the computing industry, uh, and another one is the story of the functional programming academics and, 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 and the, the, the sort of the, the small band of, um, of, of, of zealots or devotees who, who, who made functional programming sort of practical in the 80s and 90s through the languages like Haskell and OCaml. And then how these kind of, uh, both of these worlds got kind of wiped out by this tsunami of object-oriented programming. You know, Java hit the world and Microsoft almost like, well, it, it, it got into a lot of trouble legally in what it, it sort of did in its responses to the world of object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming sort of hit even something as big as the, the worldwide juggernaut of Microsoft. And then it also hit that world of academics, uh, of functional programming, those, those logicians. They couldn't quite work out how to integrate this object-oriented programming thing into their world view. And, and, and they, they had all these different reactions to what to do about this integration. And uh, uh, things like Scala come from that. I list out all the different ways I saw people reacting to this kind of problem, this sort of dialectic kind of problem of these things that don't fit together and how can we how can we make a synthesis that actually Im improves things and, 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 and integrates things? And you can see that playing through all the way through to today in C Sharp 8.0, C Sharp 9.0. They're still basically playing the same script. Okay, how do we take the ideas from functional, get them into C Sharp, make them really fly? Uh, and you can see it in, in, in F Sharp, it, it, it continues today. So check out the fsharp.org uh, slash history. And there is still time to send me feedback on that if you've got some more bits and pieces you'd like to incorporate in that. Right, okay, this is an opinion talk. I'm lucky I get to give that. Uh, okay, so what is F-sharp? First, a couple of, about uh, uh, 10 slides on where we're at with F-sharp. Uh, this is how Microsoft describe F-sharp, uh, the open source cross-platform functional language for .NET. Those of you who don't do any .NET at all, you can think of it as uh, Scala is to Java, F-sharp is to C-sharp. Uh, and it has fantastic interoperability with C Sharp, fantastic performance. You can use things like ASP.NET Core if you use Giraffe, the, web, the, the, the F Sharp uh, web programming uh, uh, DSL that sits on top of ASP.NET Core. You get a really beautiful functional, or functional first web programming stack for the server side. Uh, and so all the wonderful things that are happening in .NET Core all flow up through, uh, through F Sharp as well, and you can use all of those. Uh, but F Sharp is not just what Microsoft says it is. It's an interesting thing, and I'll talk a bit more about this from a community perspective, because F Sharp is actually a JavaScript language as well, a strong JavaScript language, where this, uh, this tool called Fable, and also another one called Web Sharper, they're both excellent uh, F Sharp to JavaScript systems. Fable is interesting because it is really positioned as a 
part of the JavaScript ecosystem. You install it and get it, get, getting started with it is just with NPM. It's no, yeah, you actually barely know you're doing any .NET programming at all. It's much more like TypeScript. F Sharp sort of feels like uh, it's, yeah, you're using any sort of TypeScript kind of mode and you get high, pretty high quality looking uh, clean JavaScript out the other end. And, uh, and as I said, it's part of the ecosystem, so if you're a JavaScript or a front-end developer, you will actually feel quite at home in the Fable community. It's a separate community in a way. Uh, uses F Sharp as the language, has its own conferences, for example. Uh, recently in Antwerp, Fable Conf went through its third, third conference. Uh, so, um, but part of the import, po important thing here is this, you know, this is what Microsoft says F Sharp is, but because of the way F Sharp is built and delivered, it can also be a JavaScript language, and this is a very much a community point of view on what F Sharp is. Uh, uh, and that's kind of because F Sharp isn't quite as, um, we really let the, me the community own the message about F Sharp. Uh, I mean, uh, Microsoft is part of that community and says, you know, we are quite open, we make and contribute to F Sharp because it is good for our Azure cloud platform. That's why we do not .NET as well, because ultimately we are a cloud platform provider as well as other things, but uh, .NET is part of Azure programmability effectively. And, and that's why Microsoft contributed to F Sharp. But F Sharp uh, has a structure through the F Sharp Software Foundation, uh, which is uh, F Sharp.org, which is very self empowered and open, cross platform, neutral, independent. Of course, it's all open source and accepting contributions. The tooling is also very community oriented. Sure, there is, there is a Visual Studio tooling, which obviously loads of people use, uh, but uh, there is also the Visual Studio Code tooling called Ionide for F Sharp, uh, which is all community, all community driven and owned. And there's also the, the JetBrains tooling in Rider, which is, is good, great, good and high quality as well. Uh, quickly running through these, you can use it with Xamarin, you can use it with Visual Studio Code, Windows, Mac, Azure. You can also use it on the other cloud platforms, Google Cloud Platform and AWS. Uh, and of course, there's a great uh, Linux story through .NET Core. Now, one of the reasons why all this works, um, it, and F, one of the reasons F Sharp could be both a JavaScript language and a .NET language is because of the F Sharp compiler service, uh, which is a single component, a single DLL, uh, which uh, powers all of the F Sharp tooling and contains all of the logic of the F Sharp implementation. So it's a very tight implementation. There's no re-implementations of F Sharp. There is one implementation of F Sharp, uh, which is delivered through the F Sharp compiler service component, and that's integrated into all of these. I've talked about Fable. There's a, there's a very a wonderful stack called SafeStack that puts together the F Sharp Fable uh, JavaScript on the, on the client side and F Sharp for .NET on the server side, and you can share your code back between the front end and back end. Uh, and, um, I encourage you to take a look at that if you're into full stack programming. And uh, my job is to focus on the actual language design generally, and that's F Sharp 4.7 we've done. I'll just quickly run through what we've done with those. I'm not gonna run through the list, you can just glance down them. What we've been doing since we really properly moved to open engineering and open source, uh, not only open source, but fully open source, open engineering, community oriented engineering. Uh, just you can glance through these, 4.1, 4.5, 4.6 and 4.7 just released. Okay. Uh, that's how you get started on .NET Core. For those who are using it, just .NET new dash lang f sharp .NET build. So it's there integrated in the .NET SDK. Uh, anywhere where the .NET SDK is used and available, then f sharp is also available. For instance, most of the cloud platforms uh, in uh, have um, the .NET SDK. Uh, in, installed and available, then you can just use F Sharp there as well. Okay, and, and just a brief, uh, you know, does it really matter to use a functional first methodology or not? And this is really key to the value proposition of why F Sharp is actually bringing value to the .NET ecosystem a, a, at all. Uh, if it was just a, um, a shell for the same syntax as C Sharp, if it didn't carry really strong either language properties or library properties or methodological uh, and uh, kind of uh, characteristics, then it wouldn't be worth doing it. But it does make a big difference 
in practice for a well-functioning F-sharp team that is able, that is using it in the right zone, can, make, is, can be exceptionally productive and accurate in their coding. And uh, of course, it's hard to prove that categorically, uh, and you can always give anecdotes, but this is one anecdote I always refer to because there are actually quite a lot of things we actually kept constant between these two things, and we're working on the same problem in the same company. Uh, and it was a, it's roughly C sharp, maybe 3.0, 4.0 era code, so it doesn't include all of the, and it was also done by an offshore team uh, rather than, it's a, what, not one in the UK, uh, but the, the one on the, the right was done by a smaller, team in the UK, so there was a C-sharp project which five, took five years at about eight developers, didn't finish all the contracts, and there was a simultaneous implementation of that uh, in the UK by an F-sharp team, and it peaked at three developers with uh, less than one year, I think, uh, and they fully implemented the contract, and a very big difference in the overall line count. Now you might say, why is there such a big difference? Well, there are reasons, braces are a big reason. Um, yeah, <laughs> there are lots and lots of lines of braces. Uh, there's also a lot of blank lines. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a lot of fair, fair proportion of blank lines in the F-sharp code too, about 10% in each. There are a lot of null checks in the C-sharp code, yeah? 3,000 null checks. That's a lot of places a thing can fail, and you can see why C-sharp 9 is just, you know, that's a big part of the F-sharp value proposition, or the the big part of the problem with C-sharp, to be honest, uh, is the pervasive presence of nulls everywhere, utterly needlessly. It just doesn't serve any role in m the vast majority of programming, certainly not in this kind of place, probably the 15 places where the F-sharp code did null checks are exactly the places you want to you wanna do them. Uh, comments are good, there's some comments, useful code, app code and so on, test code. But one thing that's very, very telling is this one, there were 2,000 try-catch uh, statements in the C-sharp code. There were nine, I think, in the F-sharp code. Uh, and this is a sign of a, a, a project that's just got out of control, okay? If you've got 2,000 places where exceptions might be happening and need to be explicitly caught and handled, then it probably means your developers have just lost track of the complexity of the code base and just every single change that they put into the code, they put a big try-catch around it just in case something goes wrong, and then they don't know where to send the exception to, and so they end up with an, I don't know, if it's an asynchronous system, you know how that can get out of control. Okay, uh, and Simon Cousins, who did this project, is absolutely uh, adamant that F-sharp, for this kind of work in the en energy industry, uh, that F-sharp is totally the safe choice for doing this kind of work, and any other choice is too risky. And he's very, very proud of the zero bugs in a deployed system for this particular one, and he's achieved that for several of his other projects as well. That doesn't mean that's gonna happen all the time by any means, but he's a, he's a very good F-sharp program and uses it well. Uh, and to say, people have built very valuable companies on uh, F-sharp, Jet.com in America, it was acquired by Walmart for three billion, Many people from Australia actually F-sharp developers. Uh, the F-sharp Sydney community got kind of, half of them got hired off to go to New York uh, uh, and, and, and work for Jet.com. And uh, yeah, it was built with F-sharp uh, as a, on, on a server side, um, sort of using a microservices architecture and very good and interesting F-sharp code. Okay, just to say the community is at the center of the technology. I've, I've touched on that. We have the F-Sharp Software Foundation, fsharp.org, right at the heart of decision making. And Microsoft worked very closely with them and, other, and they're at the center of uh, nearly everything that happens in the F-Sharp world. But not in a controlling way, but in an enabling way. And uh, Matthias is in the audience somewhere. Yes, back there, is, is on the board of the F-Sharp Software Foundation. Uh, and if you are either interested in, in just talking about like how does a foundation work, what does it mean to be on a board, uh, what does it mean to start a software foundation or legally, how can you do that, or if you have pe partners in America for, for doing that, it's actually, it's kind of both easier and harder than you expect, but it can be very worthwhile part of making a, giving a technology a good governance and a good representation uh, independent of its commercial interests. Oh, he's got stickers, yeah, even, super, great. Uh, and the community is at the center of design and implementation. We have the F-sharp language design process. We have suggestions. I've got those the wrong way around. Uh, suggestions, design, 
and then the actual implementation in the .NET uh, Foundation uh, repository. So we work with the .NET Foundation, they're overlapping foundations in many ways, slightly different. Um, yeah, so you can see the cooperation is sort of listed out here actually. And the community is at the center of tooling, Ironide, uh, WebSharp, uh, other, but many other things that happen in, in the .NET F-Sharp, and Microsoft is part of this community, so how we see ourselves. Right, but let's talk about code that I do and don't like. And one way to do that is to go to the community, and uh, a great uh, thing the community does is the F-Sharp advent calendar every year, and it's usually um, about 50 or 60 Entries written by people around the world. You're very pleased for those, doing, those of you doing F-sharp in the audience. Please contribute to the F-sharp advent calendar. To be honest, it, if you're looking to make the C-sharp community a better and more vibrant community, start a C-sharp advent calendar as well. Okay? I don't know if there is such a thing. I've never seen it, if there is. And I think it's that, that kind of community-driven activism is really missing from the C-sharp world. And considering how vast the C-sharp world is, it should be present. So if you're looking to contribute in the C-sharp world, please do that. Right, but there's lots of interesting examples of F-sharp code here. It was started by the Japanese F-sharp community back in uh, 2010, and uh, they've done an amazing job, and it's actually run in 2018 uh, as well in English. Uh, there's the original Jap Japanese entries, some of them. And um, Another way to work out what it's F-sharp code I do and don't like is to go back to the foundations of the F-sharp language design. So back in 2007, when I first started presenting on F-sharp to the sort of major audiences inside Microsoft, this was one of the slides I used in that lovely 2007 font kind of uh, sort of <laughs> images. But it was the point of F-sharp was to combine these things that it, yeah, I wanted a statically typed language, a succinct language, a scalable one, libraries, explorative, one that's interoperable with the world, and that executes uh, efficiently. And uh, so that's, of course, code that I love, has, has those characteristics. Uh, so here's an example of a tiny bit of code that I love, printfn hello, hello world, that is an F-sharp program. It's succinct, it's expressive, it interoperates, it's using .NET uh, uh, through the libraries, uh, performs well, has no bugs. Okay, so uh, when you, one of the great things about F-sharp is this pipeline operator. Uh, to take some value and you pipe it through some, uh, some function. And uh, we, we see many examples of it being like chained. I mean, half of an F-sharp program is usually code of this kind. And so you'll see, for example, uh, just extracting some parts out of uh, the F-sharp compiler services or the testing of it. We take the symbol uses, we filter them, we do a parallel map over those, we filter those, we group them, we map them. It's kind of link style pipeline kind of way. It's a bit, it's a bit different, it's a bit more, it's like taking the core ideas of, of, of link, which are obviously functional, but expanding those out and using them from pretty much half of your code ends up in this kind of uh, pipeline compositional way. Uh, another, when you look through the F-sharp uh, advent calendar entries, about half of them are about domain modeling with F-sharp. And if you don't know uh, the books and material by Scott Wallachian, uh, 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 Domain Modeling Made Functional, I think it's, is the name of the book, it's a wonderful uh, just talking why these functional programming languages are just so good for capturing the core of these, of these domains. Now, when I started, uh, uh, during my PhD when I started doing this sort of functional programming. It was really dealing, uh, I was actually at ANU, Australian National University, when I started doing this sort of thing. And it was really dealing with uh, logic structures. That was my domain, okay? So we had to represent, for instance, um, the constructs in a, in a circuit, uh, the, co the combinatorial logic in a circuit. And underneath it's like it's just, Boolean logic. You have ands, you have ors, you have nand gates, you have xors, you have nots, you have, you, ha you, you just have a, a structure, a tree, uh, a piece of data, if you like, representing the, the logic of a circuit. And so this was my domain that I, that I would work with. And then you'd just spend all day long writing your recursion, evaluation, normalization, analysis, uh, visualization, starting with this core domain 
and, uh, and, and the, key, the fact that it's so easy to model that domain and then adjust the model of it or enrich it or simplify it. There's a game that goes on where you try, in some ways you're pushed to do ultra simplification down to a very minimal domain. Sometimes you also have to augment that with a lot of real world sort of metadata as well. But uh, it, it's extremely uh, simple to model the domain and act as, you, as, you, as you modify it and change it, then the type checking uh, just naturally sort of uh, helps you adjust the, the parts of your code that need, that need a corresponding adjustment, uh, adjustment, filling in the cases uh, for the analysis. Uh, another domain that I personally work with, not one that you guys, unless you contribute to you people, unless you contribute to the F# -sharp compiler, uh, will have to work with, is to do with the optimizer in the F# -sharp compiler. And so, if you look at the optimizer and you say, well, what is its domain? Well, it, the optimizer has to know something about F# -sharp code that it sees, so it can make accurate optimizations. Well, what does it know? It knows something about an expression. And this is what it knows. It represents information known about a value. It's either we don't know anything. Val value means it's equal to another value, and we know some more information. So the of val ref is what it's equal to, and then expression value information is that extra information. And then it might know it's a tuple, it might know it's a record, and so on down. So that's the domain. And then once you see that, you, uh, you can actually more or less predict what kind of optimizations the F-sharp compiler will or won't do. And as you teach the optimizer more about F-sharp code, then the, the cases of, of the optimization logic kind of drop out. So those are my domains, but other people have their domains too. And so if you look at Luke Merritt's uh, was a blog post from the um, F-sharp advent calendar, and this is representing the domain of just different values coming back uh, from uh, a web request. Uh, is, it, uh, un uh, is the system unresponsive? Was it missing? Was some value not checked? And so on. And so that's a simple language uh, DSL, uh, in a way, for, or a modeling of the data for that domain. Uh, Odi from Nigeria in the F-sharp community uh, talks about how he's modeling the values he's getting back from, uh, I think this is iTunes service. And it's a very kind of similar kind of thing. You know, he's getting XML back, but this is the kind of minimal representation of the information coming back. And he, and he talks, has a very nice description of how your choice of data structures is uh, crucial when writing your code in F-sharp. If you screw it up, if you get the domain model wrong, uh, then you'll go around in circles. That does happen. If you get it right, then all the rest of the code kind of flows very naturally. Uh, and this is the book I mentioned, Domain Modeling Made Functional. Uh, there's also a great book called Get Programming with F-Sharp that covers some of these domain modeling and domain semantic topics. Uh, now, one of the ways uh, people come to F-Sharp and say, ah, oh, damn it, F-Sharp makes you organize your code from sort of uh, bottom up. You know, you, you write your initial code and then your main entry method ends up at the bottom and I want to put it the other way around. But there's a reason we do that. That is because F-sharp is a fantastic data scripting language and we, very, we want you to orient your code towards scripts that are like Python, sort of readable down, down as things go down the, da down the chain. So at the top of your code, you have the access to the data layer. We'll talk about that using a type provider a bit later. And then you access your, your data, and then you have your, uh, your, your extraction, your, your loading and extraction of information from that. And uh, F-sharp data scripting is a really just beautiful thing. A, a well-written F-sharp data script is extremely clear and, uh, uh, and you know, cracks some particular data extract load kind of task very nicely. Uh, Okay, um, now, and there's an area I've been working a lot in lately which has deeply inspired me about the role of functional programming in, in, in practical programming in web, in, in both Fable web programming and in .NET front-end programming, in things like Xamarin, for example, or WPF. Uh, and that is this model view update architecture for UIs. Now, in this world, the key thing is this view function. And uh, this is kind of the view function for a model view update mobile app. And the difference about writing your view in this way 
is that the view gets re-evaluated on every model update. And then is, uh, that's done uh, in, in the sort of background and, and then a, a diff. In the React kind of way, a diff is made to the actual DOM elements or the actual UI elements. And what this means is uh, you, you can have very dynamic views that can depend on things like if model pressed, then, then, then we see one view, and if, if, if we don't, we see another view. Or for example, in the, in the web version of this, then uh, if we have some text, then we say loading, and if once the text has arrived, then we actually fill in the results of the user interface. So this idea that the view can be a function which takes the model and generates view elements, and that, that it is okay to reevaluate that from a performance perspective, uh, because there's various, various tricks you use to do that, partly this differential update to the actual UI, means that your whole program can take a functional approach. Now people, it's interesting being in Mark Siemens' talk just now, he was kind of saying, well, pure functions are kind of useless because you can't actually do anything. But if those pure functions are most of your application, and then it's hosted inside of an imperative, a couple of imperative things for doing that differential update, then actually nearly all of your program logic becomes pure, pure functions. So let me, uh, do I actually have another example of that? I need to just check. Let me find you. Okay, I won't go through. But essentially you write your model in a functional way, you write your model update in a functional way, you write your view in a functional way, and then you give it all to the, 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 the host system, whether it's uh, uh, Elm or Fabulous or Fable or whichever system you're using. And you can apply functional programming to the entire, to both your server side and to your and to your and to your client side. A very powerful way of approaching UIs. And I really, if you're into functional and you do some web programming, I really encourage you to check out Fable uh, and, and SafeStack, which uh, take this approach, model view update approach. Uh, I've also been applying the approach to to Xamarin development, so you can use this kind of functional approach to Xamarin. Uh, Xamarin Forms development through a system called Fabulous. Uh, so please check that out as well. There's just some examples of some uh, apps built using Fabulous. This one, Contacts one, is a great sample showing you how to do database access, web requests, and, and the like, uh, and as well as integrating with Xamarin Essentials. And this one over here is uh, showing you how you can integrate third-party components for, you know, um, for uh, 3D as well. Okay, so uh, on to the, the, the next one, composition. You'll see examples like this for co composing the top end of a, of a program. Again, each phase of this is, in, is sort of entirely functional, lexing, parsing, binding, optimizing, code gen, uh, mapping a, another optimizing phase, uh, a backend phase, and then finishing the compiler. And uh, it's the fact that the top end composition of your program just ends up looking like composition is, uh, is lovely. And you see that in the quote from Craig there. He feels giddy. Uh, people, giddy smiles when people see it. Uh, and I already mentioned Giraffe, which takes a similar approach to composition for the top end of web requests. So you can see that it's defi defi defining a web app and using this compositional DSL to choose the different routes, URLs, index, login, user, and so on. And then the, the, the logout implementation up above. So you can apply that compositional approach both to the front end, to the back end, and to your things like your, the compilers and transformers that you're writing. Okay, so that's F sharp code I like, but I've said that F not all code is good code. I better watch your time. Uh, and uh, sometimes you'll see this kind of code. Now you notice the F-sharp library doesn't come with these two functions, but most functional language implementations do. And I left them out on purpose because I don't like them. And uh, you've, I've, I've literally seen uh, people, this, th these things ch take a, 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 a curried version of the function or a thing that takes the arguments sort of iteratively to one that takes the arguments as a tuple. And you'll see that people sometimes define these functions and do this kind of weird thing in .NET, where you can just write that. 
Okay, and there's absolutely no point in, in doing that. And they might also use something like uncurry here, and it's too indecipherable far too often. And you just write, write things out explicitly about what, what is happening. And so there's a, there's a set of uh, functorial or abstract kind of things in, in functional programming which we deliberately leave out of F-sharp. And if you're working in teams where the, the F-sharp guy or, or woman, uh, lady, defines those functions and starts using them, then just say, no, we, I don't think we should do that in this team, please. We, we, don't, we can't read your code when you write that sort of thing. So just, just don't, don't do it. Uh, there's also a back uh, pipe operator in F-sharp, which actually leads to some really weird code like this kind of thing, uh, which, uh, and I, I mean, just don't use it, okay? It doesn't help anyone. I should never have put it in, all right? I mean, a cage, there are a couple of places you can use it, it's okay, but on the whole, it's just like, uh, just, just don't, just say no, yeah? So never ever use it, and especially don't use it in beginner code, you're not doing anyone a favor. Uh, and don't ever put these things on the same line, it looks like a TIE fighter from Star Wars, I've been told, <laughs> and it's like, just don't, yeah? There are even these weird operators, which you really please don't use ever. They should not have been included, uh, and they should be deprecated once we find a proper way to really deprecate things that Microsoft is happy with. Uh, now, the, the next one is a point-free code. Uh, you'll often see people doing this add to 10 list map plus 10 or times two plus one for double an increment. Just don't write this sort of thing. Uh, so just avoid this needless point-free code and just write out the functions as functions, please. They're, you're not, uh, so, so Eric Sapalis has a great line about this. There are rare cases where point-free DSLs that are legible in the large, and I actually did show you one of those earlier uh, in the context of web programming, but just adopting this approach carries a big burden of proof, okay? And you can say that to your people in your team. You're saying, look, I'm looking at that F-sharp code you're writing, you're trying to do point-free kind of style, and just say, don't, don't you know, why? What, is it really bringing value to this team? And it, please just keep make your code clearer. F-sharp code can be extremely clear, and, and you should write it like that. Uh, and, of course, giving proper names to things is part of that. So you'll also see a lot of use of fold in some functional programming languages. Now, F-sharp actually de-emphasizes folds a lot. So instead, you do the actual sum by, max by, choose, try pick, map fold, or reduce, some specific, more specific operation. Fold is like a blunt instrument, like a go-to in your code. It's often extremely hard to understand what a fold is actually doing. Uh, so if you, um, so, so use these more specific operators, please. I'll skip on there. Uh, now, I'm aware I'm running a little bit out of time. Do I? Yeah, I'm not sure they're going to call time on me. I might go a couple of minutes over. So, okay, uh, just to say records, actually, we'll skip the part about records and talk about objects. Okay, so F -sharp does support object oriented programming. We have these inputs here, and we have these object ex internals here exported properties and exported methods. This is a fully functional object, okay? There's no actual state here. It's effectively just taking the inputs, getting some derived uh, computation, and then publishing those in various ways. And these are the core features that we have. We have uh, class types, interface types, and these object expressions. Uh, so F-sharp object-oriented programming can be used extremely well in this kind of way. Here's some part of some uh, parser thing which is uh, taking the kernels and then doing a whole lot of computations and then publishing them. Exactly what I showed before, just in a little bit more richer, different kind of setting. Functional computation encapsulated inside objects. Now, the problem with object-oriented programming, and we, this is when, we, when I did the F-sharp language design, I remember sitting down with Dominic Cooney, who's from Australia, uh, from Brisbane, who's an intern with me, and we started to really kind of uh, deconstruct OO. And OO is, is actually loads of different features, right? Uh, from the dot notation all the way down to aspect-oriented programming or, or, or other ideas that have come out of the object-oriented community. And the question is, what do you kind of do with all of these? Do you really need them all? And some of these, okay, I think, calling time? Yeah. Oh, I've got a whole 20 minutes as well. Man, they're generous. Okay, good, then I can slow down. Uh, so, so, so some of these things, 
what are they all about, all these ideas that have come from the object-oriented kind of tradition? Um, well, some of them are about a better API language, some of them make f -sharp a better implementation language, some of them are part of an interop standard, some of them we can just kind of ignore. So, it's, we, we, we effect, effectively kind of did that bit by bit, we came to a stable characterization where you're not going down the slippery slope in a sense, you're not, you, you can draw lines about object-oriented features. And these are the lines that I draw. So let's run through these. So the basic use of the dot notation is something that f -sharp embraces. You can go x dot length. Now if you know other functional languages, that's not always true for other, uh, for other functional languages. But f -sharp is quite happy to say, look, I know what the type of x is, I can work out what the length is, what, what's being resolved by dot length, uh, by that name, and we can use the dot notation quite happily with a couple of type annotations. And that, of course, means we need to have instance members and methods, and that is what I call type-directed name resolution. Uh, and you've already seen this notion of implicit constructor that allows you to have the inputs to the object at the top, and then these let bindings, and then these members, and that, uh, uh, that's a part of the object-oriented um, tradition as well. Static members, index notation, named arguments, optional arguments, interface types, and implementations. Now, all of these things are fit absolutely fine in the context of functional object-oriented programming. You could, you could put all of these things into a Haskell and it would just work absolutely just fine. So we can Im Im absolutely embrace these as part of functional programming and, and uh, it's an important, a lot of micro decisions are made in f -sharp to make these things work very well while also keeping the core goodness of functional programming. Then there's a range of things which are exceptionally useful in practice but you need to be a little bit cautious about how you, how you use them in F-sharp, but you can learn to use them tastefully. There's a whole idea that you can actually mutate data in F-sharp, you can do side effects, it is an imperative language, uh, but with a functional first kind of emphasis. Then uh, you can define operators, auto properties, you can implement these standards like I disposable, I enumerable, you can do type extensions, .NET things like events, structs, delegates, enums, and type casting. So we use those where necessary, use them kind of respectfully, sparingly, there's kind of got to be a rationale for using those things. And then there is a sort of set, set of things which F-sharp programming really de-emphasizes and probably the most important one for the C-sharp programmers to know about is that F-sharp really de-emphasizes the use of large type hierarchies. Now C-sharp has already de-emphasized that compared to Java. Okay, one of the great things that C-sharp has did, I think, was to say uh, we don't need to just, uh, you know, hierarchically classify our animals, cats and dogs and everything into, in all the way through our code. There's, I, I, this is, it's like, once you give programmers a tool to do hierarchical classification, it's like they go crazy. They just start classifying everything. And that's where you get that abstract class, factory, bean, whatever sort of things you see in Java. Uh, and it's, it's like some part of the human psychology or something that once we, once we can classify things, we just love to, love to do it. It's like, uh, so so F-sharp doesn't do that. We have very small type hierarchies in F-sharp. Uh, you can see from some of the language constructs I've shown before that uh, you can do domain modeling without defining zillions of types. You just define one, one type with all the different cases. Uh, so, um, so large type hierarchies are not a, a, a big thing, and that also means we massively de-emphasize implementation inheritance. Uh, you can occasionally do it for, for performance reasons or for some kind of modeling reasons, often in the core of a, a, li a library, uh, uh, but on the whole we don't, do, it's sort of hidden away, but we don't do implementation inheritance. You share, there's a, a much, f -sharp object oriented programming has a much stronger emphasis on, dele on delegation. Uh, than uh, implementation inheritance for, for sharing. Um, and uh, it's really important to understand that, that what problems implementation and inheritance cause. Uh, and um, the thing about implementation inheritance is you're always taking something that's already complex and making it more complex, okay? And that's like, uh, that's, the, that, that's the nature of it. You, and you can't hide that complexity way like you can with delegation. So 
please delegate, don't use implementation inheritance. It nulls and unchecked default of, and you know, really heavy use of method overloading is also uh, sort of, that's down the object rabbit hole, and we don't go there very often in F sharp. And we uh, have to have exceptionally good reason to do it. Then we have uh, a set of things which we don't support at all. Technical things, curried method overloads, self types, wildcard types, aspect oriented programming, whatever, and you can just, they're not supported. So roughly speaking, you love the first set, please, you tolerate the second set, you mostly avoid the, second, the, the, the third set, and you absolutely forget all about the, the fourth set. And the difference there is really between object programming and object oriented programming. F sharp absolutely supports object programming. It's part, you can see from this that it's the first set and to some extent the second set uh, what object programming is about. And it's a major part of the F sharp methodology and you, and you have to be good at object programming to be a good F sharp programmer. But we don't, uh, we don't really embrace object oriented programming. We support object programming, but we support sequence programming as well. We support async programming. There's, uh, there's many different kind of computational structures that all flow together and work nicely in, in, in F-sharp, and that doesn't mean you have to obsessively think about classification and object orientation for every part of your code. So what's the difference? Object programming focuses on these things, succinct coding, notational convenience, API ergonomics. Yeah, we love the .NET design guidelines. They're, they're great. No, and we, I mean, should you, you should know them and learn them as an F-sharp programmer. Good naming, practical encapsulation, small composable abstractions, and this thing at the bottom, making simple things out of potentially complex foundations. That's absolutely key. Object-oriented programming in its extreme is sort of this um, uh, sort of dogmas, you know. Everything's an object. We, we must hire, it's, it's sort of page, pages one to 10 of the object-oriented programming book, okay. Hierarchical classification is at the center of how we think. Large abstractions are often with many, many holes and nulls and failure points and exceptions and un unimplemented methods and uh, tends to focus on declarations, not expressions, and composition through hierarchies. And you can, this is not what, where F sharp lands, this is, what we, this is where we land. Embrace object programming. And make it fit with a expression-oriented, typed, functional pro uh, programming paradigm. Okay, uh, <coughs> so just to say there's some other really magical parts of F-sharp. One of them is, is type providers. Uh, I showed you an example of this earlier. I'll flick back to it. Rather than trying to load up a web browser that probably won't connect. Uh, that was in here. Uh, so the first use of this is the, is the HTML provider. And this is one of the most magically and under, uh, unknown parts of the F-sharp magic. And this is where you can point the, an F-sharp type provider at a URL, and it will do analysis of the data on that and schema on that, on that URL, and then give you the contents of that back in a strongly typed way without any more code. So you can see the tables.version history is uh, extracting one of the tables out of that, uh, out of that URL, and then you get strong completion and typing into r.minor version. And if you look at that actual web page, you'll see that its table has a column heading called minor version. Uh, and so you're actually doing sort of screen scraping, strongly typed screen scraping without ever, because we've got this type provider that is doing the schema analysis on that page at compile time to allow us to do strongly typed programming against it. Uh, you can also snapshot a page as a sample schema for that. There's also, uh, type providers for CSV and for JSON and many, and for databases and many, uh, 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 for Azure table storage, for Azure, the Azure storage type provider. Uh, you can just point your, um, point your data script directly at your, Azure, at your Azure storage and you get strongly typed access through to everything uh, on, on those, uh, everything that you can access through that. Okay, so skipping forward again, sorry. Uh, now, F-sharp has another feature called computation expressions. 
so, and you, you'll sometimes in functional languages, you'll see this kind of code, and this is not good F out code. It's like list.concat entities, list filter, list filter, filter collect cons, filter, 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 and so on. All to make a, 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 a list. And, um, but F sharp has a language feature that makes that code much more clear. And it, it allows you to write it out using for loops. It's all functional, it's a functional translation underneath. But uh, you'll, you know, for E and entities, yield that one. For these generic parameters, if that, yield that. And you can see how much clearer that code is, even though it's actually logically equivalent to that code before. So this is called a computation expression. It's a, it's a list expression where you're computing a list as you go. It's a bit like C sharp uh, enumerators, uh, enumerator methods. Uh, but you can use it in an expression like this in any expression form, and you can use it to create arrays and on-demand sequences and, and uh, other, other structures. Uh, so uh, you, the same feature is used for async code. Uh, so you'll see here, you know, the server is async this, the client is async that, the browser is async this with a, some sort of sleep in there. And then we put those in parallel and we, we run those uh, things. And so these act like tasks. Now, async is uh, it's a lovely programming paradigm. And uh, one of the great things is the cancellation tokens flow implicit through, implicitly throughout this whole program. Uh, but it does have, uh, it's, it's, it's not as performant as task. And in F sharp 5.0, we're going to be putting in native support for task curly using a similar, using F sharp computation expressions as well. Uh, and one of the amazing things about F-sharp computation expressions is we've been able to do so many things with them, uh, and yet all, you know, we've been able to do async tasks, the computations I've shown before, sequences, async sequences, things that they're putting in one by one into C-sharp, we kind of get them all for free from this more general kind of mechanism. And we're, we're getting the performance side of things for tasks sorted out to be on, on, on par with C-sharp tasks in the next version of F-sharp. So you can do async sequences, for example. It's in a library. You'd async sequence with the sleep, then yield, then sleep, then yield. And, uh, and similarly, yield this while true, take a sleep, and, and, and yield another date for a, for an, for an, for a stream of, of dates. And that library is f control.asyncc. But there are many other examples uh, of f -sharp computation expressions. They're used for all sorts of interesting, uh, interesting things. Okay, so just to finish off, uh, F, good F-sharp practice, it, it's, it's not about functional obscurity. It's about writing great, clear code, code that could be debugged, commented, tested, that is profiled, is, profiled, is performant under CI, and it is readable. We fully embrace the software, these, all these aspects of software engineering methodology and don't uh, ever let people think that it's about just about sort of approach, and it's about writing obscure code. It's the opposite. It's about writing crystal clear code that conveys the intent and lets you focus on your domain rather than on the on the details of programming. Okay, so uh, I will I'll close there. F sharp em uh, emphasizes clear code to solve real world problems. It's absolutely at the center of uh, the F-sharp code I love. It's always been our description of F-sharp, clear, succinct code uh, to solve real-world problems. Uh, not all functional code is good code. Not all object-oriented code is good code. Uh, and object programming is different to object-oriented programming. And uh, thank you very much. And yeah, I guess we've got time for some, quest for some questions. Thank you. Time for questions, or do we not take any questions in the talk? We can take a couple of, couple of questions, maybe. Anyone? Yeah, here. Yep. Uh, okay, so uh, F-sharp invented to some extent, there's a long history to the idea of async programming, but it, in, it essentially invented the idea or that to turn code into async code, you just had to put async curly around your code, or the C-sharp equivalent of that is just put a wait 
into your code and it be becomes async. Now F Sharp made that invention and delivered it as part of F Sharp in its first version. And then the C Sharp team put in its version of, of async in, in terms of tasks. Okay. And then the rest of the world has gone on to add a async or task support into the various languages. Uh, now, uh, the F Sharp approach does do, it is really very nice. I encourage you to look at the paper called the F Sharp Asynchronous Programming Model. And it, uh, it and also Thomas's, Thomas Petrachek's material on, on the differences between the F Sharp and C Sharp systems. Uh, a, a key thing in the F Sharp is that, uh, in the F Sharp system is that the cancellation tokens are propagated implicitly. Okay, so you don't have, to, in C Sharp, you'll always, uh, it's, 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 C Sharp async is very nice, but you'll always see this explicit plumbing of these cancellation tokens all the way through. It's done implicitly. You can't, it, and it means it's a whole range of mistakes you can't make with regard to cancellation. But that does come up with, with a performance cost in that there's a, uh, there's there's a two-stage process for activating an F Sharp async. You compose them and then activate them and it just means that you can't quite get the same level of performance as you can with task. So in practice, we do need task support, and they are different types, but they interoperate very seamlessly. You can go async to task and async from task. And so I think the best resolution to that is just put it straight into the F Sharp language and into the compiler and make sure we get the same performance uh, characteristics as, as C Sharp code, and I've been working a lot on that lately. Uh, it will be a, ge a more general mechanism. We'll make sure it works for, for, for task sequences as well, state machine compilation of those, and also user-defined computational structures, task-like things, uh, which uh, can benefit from so what is state machine or resumable code. Okay, so uh, another question? Any anyone else? Okay, I think we're done then. Thank you very much.